Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video on principal component analysis. All right, so in the previous uh, video, we just motivated uh, the need for dimensionality reduction. Uh, so the way we motivated was that sometimes if we have collected a lot of measurements of features of uh, our input data, uh, then maybe some of these features are redundant. For instance, you measured both the speed in miles per hour and the speed in kilometers per hour, or maybe some of these uh, features are highly correlated, for instance, a student's work ethics and the corresponding grade. So the basic purpose of dimensionality reduction would be to remove such redundancies and uh, reduce the number of features, which could help speed up algorithms. Since the running time often depends on the number of features, it would also reduce the storage requirements. And maybe it could also use, be useful for visualization, in particular, if we could get it all the way down to, say, two or three features. Now, PCA and then the basic idea in principal component analysis is that we would like to project our feature vectors onto a k-dimensional subspace. And as we saw in the previous video, this is equivalent to finding uh, k orthogonal unit vectors, z1 up to zk. And then once we have those, we can project a feature vector x to the projection, which we derived the formula for is just the sum over these k uh, vectors in the basis. You take the inner product between x and zi, this numeric value is then multiplied onto set i. And if we do this, this would give the projection of p onto the subspace, and we can write this x, basically we can write the coefficients of x in this new basis as just x is in a product with set one up to x is in a product with set k. So in this way, our new representation of x only has k features. Now, the question that we ended up in the previous video with was, you know, what is the basis that we should choose? Which vectors set one to set k or would be meaningful to use in this basis? And this is what we'll try to look at in this video and also the next. Okay, so let's try to start out with a motivating example. Right? So let's say I have this data here. And if we wanted to just, this is a two dimensional data set, and if we wanted to just make a one dimensional representation, then at least this data here is sitting on a line. So we would like this red direction to be the direction that we project onto in some sense, right? So we would like to project onto a single vector set one. And intuitively this vector set one, the one that we like is the one that's in the same direction as this line. Because if we project onto this one, do the orthogonal projection onto this line, then each of these uh, points will just be mapped down here to the corresponding blue points. And basically we preserve the full structure of the data set if we manage to just map them, project them onto set one. Right, this would, these, in all these cases, are the orthogonal projections of the points. So if we do this, right, then the, the corresponding one-dimensional representation is just the position along this, uh, this line or in the direction of set one. So these points are mapped to basically the same data set just in one dimension. And so this is uh, what we'd like, right? So, so what we'll try to do now is to say, okay, so what is it actually that characterizes this set one? You know, what is it that is special about this direction? And in particular, you know, why is it better than this other direction set two? Can we somehow give a, a formal definition of a good direction, right? So if we look at what happens if we project onto set two, we can see that, well, the points now will projected orthogonally onto set two, so they will be lying out here, uh, just as uh, a single uh, blob of points in this one position. So maybe one first guess at what makes for a good direction would be the direction that uh, maximizes the remaining norms of the projected points. And if you think about it, well, then this is actually not, this does not really distinguish set one and set two, right? Because if we project out here, all the points are still very far away from the origin. So they actually have a large, uh, the projection onto set two is still very large. Uh, whereas uh, this is also the case for set one. Uh, but what looks better about set one is that um, in set one, the points are kind of more spread out. Like you can see here, here they're kind of scattered all over, still has the same structure as they had before, whereas they all collapse to basically a single point if we project onto set two. Okay, so we could also see uh, what happens if we add a little bit of noise to the data, right? So all the points are kind of moved a little bit from the previous position. And we'll still see that if we project onto these two different directions, it is still by far the most spread out in the direction set one that it is in the direction set two. Right, so, so somehow we like that the direction that we project onto spreads out the points. So let's try to see if we can formally define what it means to spread out the points. So uh, if we look at a set of real values x1 to xn, then uh, what we can define from these values is what we call the sample mean, which is just the average of the points. Okay, And once we have an average, we can define a sample variance 
which is just the average over all the points of the square distance to the mean, the square difference between that value and the mean. Okay. Now, if we look at the sample variance of the projections onto either set one and set two, so you know, if we look at uh, the projection onto set two, we can look at what is the value of the uh, the coordinates, meaning basically what are the inner products onto set two, and we'll see here that oh, you know, all even though all these points have uh, large values, they're kind of sitting all of them together here. And the sample mean is the average of all of them. So the sample mean is this purple uh, or pink point in here. That's the mean. Now, the sample variance then now is the average of all the blue points of the square distance to this mean. And as you can see here, right, they're all basically very, very close to the mean. So here, the sample variance is very small if we project onto set two. If we instead project onto set one, and the points are very spread out here in the sample, uh, mean is sitting somewhere here and the sample variance is in the average square distance to this mean and in this case you can see that the, this is very large right There's, the sample variance is much larger if we project onto set one than if we project onto set two okay now so the basic idea now is that uh, what we'll try to aim for in principle component analysis is that we, we basically believe that the direction that has the largest variance a sample variance if we project onto this direction is also the direction that has the most information about the data and that's the kind of intuition that we will be, be following here and this is sometimes also referred to in the literature that we say that the signal to noise ratio is the largest in this direction so so somehow uh, there's a lot of signal meaning there's a, there's a lot of variance uh, in the, the in how far away the points are in this direction so that's the basic idea underlying principal components and analysis. So if we go back to PCA, right, we want to project onto a k-dimensional subspace, meaning we'll want to find k orthogonal unit vectors and project uh, the feature vectors onto these vectors. Then which basis should we choose? We should choose the basis that maximizes this uh, variance, the sample variance in the directions that we project onto. So, so let's try to, to formalize this again, or try to see how we can choose such a basis. Okay, so uh, so we'd like to choose these directions for projections greedily. So the basic idea is that we in PCA is that we'll go through uh, these k directions one at a time, and we'll choose each of these uh, directions greedily, so one at a time. So when we want to choose the ith direction, we have to choose it as a unit length vector, and it has to be orthogonal to the previous one. This is like the definitional requirement for for such a basis. <laughs> Not the normal basis. So this is what we require. And what else do we require? Well, we want to have that if we look at the sample variance of all these new values that we get, right? So these are all the projections onto this set I that we're choosing. The sample variance of this collection of values should be the largest possible amongst all the vectors I could choose that are orthogonal and unit length. Uh, that should be orthogonal to the previous ones that we've already chosen. So this is the greedy part of it. We just pick the one that looks best now, the one that has the largest sample variance if we look at uh, the projections onto this, this vector. And so this actually gives PCA. Now, the question is, of course, uh, how can this direction be computed efficiently? Right? This is not immediately clear just by uh, looking at the definition here, this, this greedy way of picking it. So this is what we'll try to, to answer now. Right. So to, to answer it, uh, we'll first simplify it a little bit, this uh, this whole setup, and let me try to explain this to you. So the simplification that we're going to do is that we're going to take our, our data, and before we start uh, doing anything, uh, before we start finding these directions, uh, we make the mean of every feature zero. Right. So it basically means that we have this data that's kind of sitting far away from the origin. We're going to make the mean in the y direction zero, so we're going to kind of move it down so that they are evenly spaced around uh, zero. And we're going to move it right as well here on the x direction so that the mean in the x direction is also uh, zero. Now, formally, the way we do this is that if we have the data matrix here, right, so all the feature vectors are the rows of the matrix, all the uh, individual features are the columns, then uh, making the mean zero of a feature, basically have, we have to subtract off the same value from every uh, entry in the jth column here. So in the jth column, so if we want to make the mean zero, basically what we have to subtract off from every entry is just the current mean. So if we subtract off the current mean, which is the sum from one to n of xij, that's the current mean of this column, if we divide by n, if we subtract that off from each and every one of these individual entries, then we get that the new mean is exactly zero. 
This is like a pre-processing step that we do to the data. We just take every column of the data matrix, meaning every feature, and subtract off the current mean from every entry, resulting in a new mean of precisely zero. Okay. So if we look at this and we look at uh, you know how much how big is the variance in one of these directions? So I have a direction set J that I would like to um, evaluate. What is the sample variance in this direction? So to do this, we had to first compute the sample mean, right? So the new the values in this direction, right, would be all these inner products onto set J would be the mean of them. And the sample variance would then be the, the mean of the square difference between each of these uh, values, the, the prediction onto set J minus the mean squared. And so what happens now is that you know, the interesting property is that, okay, so we've just taken all the features, right? So the X coordinate and the Y coordinate of all our vectors, and we have ensured that the mean in each of these directions is zero, right? So, so the mean in the X direction, the first feature, and the mean in the Y direction, the second feature is zero. So what does this mean for the sample mean and the sample variance? Let's try and see, all right? So, so this was the definition of the sample mean and what we did was that, uh, well, if we want to expand this, it's just this inner product, right? We just sum over all the features, right? From K equals one to D, if the D features, and basically it's the K the coordinate of XI and it's the Kth coordinate of uh, set J. So this is just the inner product unfolded. And what we do now is that we swap the order of these summations. So we now first sum over K, then we sum over I. And we move this, the set J sub K does not depend on I, so we can move it outside. So now we have this inner sum here. And what is this inner sum saying? Well, we can see that K is fixed, right? This basically means corresponds to fixing a feature, right? So fixing the Kth feature, and then we're summing all the endpoints. So we're basically summing the Kth column of the data matrix. And since we just ensure that the mean is zero, if the mean is zero of any column, then this sum is zero, right? So the whole trick now is that if we if we average or set the mean to zero on every individual feature, now what we get is that the sample mean, no matter which direction J I'm looking at, if I look at the, the sample mean in this direction, so I look at all these inner products onto set J and I mean, take the mean of them, it's always gonna be zero. Even though set J is not pointing directly in the, in the direction of the first feature, or directly in the direction of the second feature, it actually holds for all the directions that the sample mean will always be zero if we first did this normalization. Okay, so this is nice because the mean will simplify, it's just zero and the sample variance also simplifies because this uh, the mean is zero. So we just get that the average of all the, uh, points of the squared inner product onto the J is uh, is the sample variance. So much simpler now. So if we go back and uh, look at this PCA algorithm, right, we would like to figure out what is this direction uh, set I that I should uh, add in these, each of these greedy steps. What we'll start by doing is we'll start by making the mean of every feature zero. So this is what we do here, because if you make the mean of every feature zero, then uh, this is a simple, the sample variance is just this average of the squared inner products onto ZI. Right, so this is a, a simpler uh, expression. And we just want to now pick ZI to be unit length. It should be orthogonal to the previous uh, vectors that we already chose. And then we want, would like to, base, under these uh, constraints, we would like to maximize uh, the sample variance, which is the, the sum of the average over all the training points of the squared inner product onto ZI. Okay, so this is what we're looking for in, in each iteration. Now, and here's something interesting, we're not gonna prove it, but uh, using a linear algebra fact, there's actually a very uh, simple way of figuring out what these vectors should be. And uh, so we'll not prove it here, but if we take the data matrix, right? X is the one that has all the, fe the uh, feature vectors as rows, then it actually happens that these, these set i's that we have to choose, the i's one of them, is actually equal to uh, the eigenvector mu i corresponding to the ith largest eigenvalue of the matrix x transpose x. Okay, so we have to compute this matrix x transpose x, and then we just need to pick, and, in, and it has some eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and I'll remind you what those are. 
And the ones that we have to use now is that we should use the, the top K, the one that have the largest eigenvalues, the K largest eigenvalues. These are the ones we should be looking for. And then we should take those K eigenvectors. And these are the ones that we should choose as our basis. Okay, so this is a fact that we will not be proving, but, but this is nonetheless a fact. Just to remind you what a linear, uh, in these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, if I have an n by n matrix, uh, real symmetric one in, in some cases, but just an n by n matrix, then uh, an eigenvector mu uh, has an eigenvalue lambda. And such a vector is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. If I take my vector mu and I multiply it with a, then I get the vector itself back scaled by this lambda. Right. So, so basically these eigenvectors are, are vectors that uh, when you multiply them with the matrix, they become themselves times some scaling, and the scaling is the eigenvalue. Okay. And there are many efficient algorithms for computing eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and we'll not be covering them here. Right. But this is what an eigenvalue is. It's some and an eigenvector. It's a vector that scales to a, a copy of itself if I multiply it onto the matrix. So this gives the PCA algorithm, you know, so if we have, we want to find these K uh, orthonormal vectors like unit length and orthogonal to each other. And the ones we should choose in PCA to maximize the variance are precisely the ones corresponding to the K large, the K eigenvectors corresponding to the K largest eigenvalues of X transpose X, if I take the data matrix. So these are the ones I should pick. And now I'll just project my feature vector onto this linear combination where I compute the inner product of X of, with each of these set I's and I multiply with set I that gives me the projection onto the subspace. And I could also write my X in this basis spanned by the, as a basically a vector uh, spanned by these uh, set I's. If I just write down each of the coefficients corresponding to each of the basis vectors, I think this would be the, the reduced or projected point. And what we'll do in the next video is that, uh, so we did not here give a proof that this fact is true, like, you know, that the K top eigenvectors are the ones we should pick. Uh, in the next video, we will actually give a proof via a different method. So instead of trying to maximize the variance, we'll give an, another proof that leads to the same uh, algorithm, the same choice of set one to set K, which shows that there are several good reasons and motivations for choosing these set ones to set K. So we'll try to argue in the next video why these are the best ones you could you could pick. Right, so, so let us end here and please continue to the next video for more on PCA.